Welcome to worship. Today we continue to rejoice, reflect and recall the hope and love that the Easter season brings. Because of the cross and resurrection, we as part of God's people can flourish. So rejoice! Many of our people from around the Yorkshire North and East District have gathered this weekend in Scarborough using the theme Rooted in Love. In our service we will also explore the theme. So welcome to worship and welcome to Rooted in Love. us pray. Generous God, for the glimpses of your glory that surround us in the wonder and complexity of the creation, in the uniqueness of each person, in the creativity and growth of human knowledge, we thank you. May your church in its worship and its life Reflect your glory and be seen amongst us day by day. And may your church become a vehicle of light, love and life in the communities we serve. To you, O oh God, be the glory of our life together. Amen and a prayer specially written for this Flourish weekend. Creator of all, we pray with expectant hearts for what you will reveal to us through the Flourish process of gatherings and reflections. 
we give thanks for the work of the planning team, the speakers and contributors at the Scarborough event. We ask that we too may be encouraged and inspired as we worship together today. May we all sense your spirit moving amongst us, knowing that we are rooted in love. May this time together in this Easter season give to us fresh hope, inspiration, encouragement and motivation to join you, loving God, in mission and service. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Psalm chapter 92 verse 1 to 6 and verses 12 and 30. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night to the music of the lute and the harp, to the melody of the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands, I sing for joy. How great are your works, O Lord! Your thoughts are very deep. The dullard cannot know, the stupid cannot understand this. The righteous flourish like the palm tree and grow like a cedar in Lebanon. They are planted in the house of the Lord. They flourish in the courts of our God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Peter was sad. Peter was Jesus' best friend. And when Jesus needed him most, Peter let Jesus down. Peter told people he never knew Jesus. And Jesus was killed. Now Jesus was gone forever. Peter was sad. Peter was confused. Mary, Joanna and Mary Magdalene couldn't find Jesus' body. They said Jesus wasn't where they buried him. Peter ran to the tomb. He found the cloths Jesus was wrapped in, but no Jesus. He walked away wondering, where was Jesus? Peter was confused. Peter was excited. Peter was having dinner with his other friends. The room was locked. And Jesus appeared. He said, peace be with you. They were all filled with joy. Jesus was alive and he forgave them. Jesus sent them to share his forgiveness with everyone. Peter was excited. Peter was loud. The Holy Spirit came on him with fire in a crowd. He stood up, raised his voice and told thousands of people about Jesus. The Spirit reminded Peter of God's promise. My body will rest in hope. You will not abandon me to the grave nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Peter knew Jesus was alive and Jesus would be alive forever. Peter told everyone about Jesus. Jesus is alive and ruling the world. Jesus is alive and forgives sins. Jesus is alive and will take everyone who trusts him to be with him. Jesus is alive forever. Sometimes we're sad for failing Jesus. 
the living Jesus forgives us. Sometimes we're confused. The living Jesus is with us. Be excited. Be loud. Jesus is alive forever. Matthew 22 verses 34 to 40 Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with his question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it, love your neighbour as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Thanks be to God for the reading of his word. The theme of this uh, Flourish weekend is rooted in love. And there can hardly be more a more appropriate passage than that that we've just read about loving the Lord our God with all our heart and soul and mind. Verses, incidentally, which recur in two of the other Gospels, Mark and Luke. The Pharisees, who first posed this question to Jesus, reckoned that they were experts in the law. Uh, they had, in fact, uh, sort of codified the Ten Commandments given to Moses by God on Mount Sinai into uh, over 600 other sort of sub-rules and uh, they reckoned that they would surely be able to catch Jesus out on one or other of them by asking this question, which is the most important. <clears throat> but the reply that Jesus gave them is hardly one with, that anybody could disagree with uh, because he quoted the Old Testament word 
the word. Uh, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. Words that come from the Old Testament and in the book of Deuteronomy. And words actually which the Orthodox Jew recites morning and night, even to this day. They were very important. They were central uh, to the Jewish faith. And here Jesus is affirming that for Christians too, these verses, these words are foundational uh, for us. There's nothing more important than loving God with everything that we have and everything that we are. But how are we to do that? Jesus leaves us some very practical and specific instructions here. First of all, he said we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart. And that's a phrase that we're all familiar with, I'm sure. Who hasn't said, I love you, darling, with all my heart, or words to that effect, to somebody uh, who's very dear to them. And heart religion is actually uh, authentic Christian faith. If it doesn't touch the heart, then there's something inadequate about it. Uh, remember that at the end of his earthly life, Jesus had that encounter with Peter on the beach. And what did he ask him? Do you love me? Do you truly love me? It wasn't, have you understood all my teaching, anything you'd like, like me to go over again? Do you love me? That was the heart of it. That was the most important thing. And we white Westerners have always been a little bit wary of emotion in our religion. You know, we don't want to be over emotional about it. Uh, of course, emotionalism is a very different thing. That's, that's uh, wrong and to be avoided. But emotion is very important. To love God must touch our heart. The sort of emotion that those disciples uh, experienced on the road to Emmaus, you remember, and they said afterwards, didn't our heart burn within us as we talked with him, with him on the way? The sort of emotion that John Wesley himself experienced in the upper room when he said, my heart was strangely warmed. And that's very important. Our hymns and songs are full of it, aren't they? Love divine, all love's excelling. Take my love, O Lord, my poor, I pour at thy feet, it's treasure store. I love you more than any other. The hymns and songs are full of it. Now, perhaps our worship is a touch too cerebral. Perhaps if we'd never had a tear in our eye and a lump in our throat about our faith and our relationship to Jesus, it's somewhat inadequate. Love the Lord your God with all our heart. And then Jesus says, with all your soul. And we're on to, into rather different territory here. What's the soul? We're not quite sure what to make of that word how to define it. John Wesley once said, I am something distinct from my body, but when my body dies, I shall not die. And we're, we're all of us tempted to think, I am a body and I have a soul, but actually it's the other way around. I am a soul and for the time being at least, I have a body. The time will come when I don't have a body, but I will continue my living soul is the real me. It's uh, the word that uh, is translated psyche, and that's a word that we use in English, that's the, the Greek word. Uh, the Genesis story, if you go right back to the creation, tells us uh, how God formed man and woman from the dust of the earth, and he breathed into them the breath of life, and they became living souls. The Quaker author, a man called Richard Foster, has written these words. Superficial, superficiality, he says, is the curse of our age. We're in desperate need, not of more intelligent people, not of more gifted people, but of more deep people. We need a sort of spirituality that satisfies the soul and feeds us at the very deepest level of our being. To misquote the Heineken advert of the 1970s, Real Christian love reaches those parts that mere religion cannot reach. The Holy Spirit can change our deepest being 
so that we can love God with all our soul. And then thirdly, Jesus says, with all our mind. And here we're back on rather more, ter more familiar territory. Our minds need to be devoted to God. St. Paul wrote, brothers and sisters, stop, th stop thinking like children. Be infants in regard to evil, but be grown up in your thinking. St. Peter said, prepare your minds for action. Always have an answer to everyone who asks you for the uh, reason for the hope that is in you. So our mind is vital in our Christian discipleship. Uh, and that's why we need to uh, study our Bibles, to read good Christian literature, to take opportunities to join with others in discussion, to deepen our faith and explore it more deeply. Uh, John Stott once said we ought to avoid being the sort of Christians who are keen but clueless, the menace of what he called mindless Christianity. So we need to think hard and uh, the Christian faith has always been at the forefront of uh, instruction, of learning, of education, founding Sunday schools, establishing day schools, seeking to combat theological ignorance uh, by uh, sound teaching from Scripture. So love the Lord your God with all your mind. And then Jesus adds, and your neighbour as yourself. In 1743, John Wesley wrote these words uh, under the title, The Portrait of a Methodist. A Methodist is one who has the love of God shed abroad in his heart, one who loves the Lord with all his heart and soul and mind and strength. His heart is full of love to all mankind. And that final phrase, full of love to all mankind, uh, leads us into this final commandment that Jesus gives uh, here. Love your neighbour as yourself. Our love for God must overflow in our uh, love for other people. We love God with all that we have and are, and then we live, as it were, inside out. So that our love for God expresses itself in practical love for other people. And notice one small but very important word in what Jesus is saying here. The little word, all. All your heart. All your soul. All your mind. We're not to love God with only some of those things. Some of our heart, some of our soul, some of our mind, but with 100% of each. And that way we shall be truly rooted and grounded in love. Not a might would I withhold 
take my intellect and use every power as thou shalt choose. Take my will and make it thine, it shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own, it shall be thy royal throne. Take my love, my Lord, I pour at thy feet its treasure store. Take myself, and I will be ever only all for thee. Ephesians chapter 3 verses 14 to 21. For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with the power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, for ever and ever. Amen. All you need is love. Love is all you need. To those of a certain age, those words sung by four lads from the port of Liverpool on our west coast recall the excitement of a new sound in pop music in the 1960s. All you need is love. And guess what? <laughs> they were right. Love is all you need, if it's the right kind of love. And that's what Paul is writing about in a letter named after another port city in the ancient Mediterranean world of the Roman Empire, Ephesus. Many of Paul's letters were written hurriedly, with Paul on the move around those cities and towns of the Mediterranean, often in reply to notes he'd received reporting problems and arguments in the church. What should they do? How should we respond? Paul, help us! But now Paul is imprisoned, trapped in one place, unable to travel, but with time on his hands. So these writings are more considered. Some say this was a general letter circulated widely amongst the churches and not just to a particular group of followers in Ephesus. Paul addresses disunity, brokenness, the disunity and conflict within each one of us. The disunity and conflict within groups, like churches and nations. The disunity and brokenness in nature. For Paul, all this can be repaired, returned to wholeness when everything and everyone is reunited, is united, in Christ. The whole of life is to be rooted and grounded in love. Rooted and grounded in love. That's verse 17. God's love, self-giving love, love seen and known through Christ. God with us, recalling the nations, the natural world, and each person back 
to be rooted and grounded in love. To be welcomed home into God's realm of justice and joy. And from that prison cell, Paul urges the churches to carry and proclaim the message that Christ, in Christ, all the discordant, broken, fractured elements of human life and the planet itself are to be made whole and therefore will flourish. For all to flourish as God intends, sharing the message was the task of those small, vulnerable churches around the ancient Roman world. For all to flourish as God intends, sharing that message is our task in and through our work and witness in the places where we live in the here and now. But our churches cannot go out and proclaim until we, ourselves, experience something of the limitless love of God in Christ. The quality of our life together should be a foretaste of the kingdom of love and grace that God wants to give, an offer to the whole inhabited earth. Our lives together will not be perfect, but we should always seek to be rooted and grounded in love. Then share what we know in loving service and telling the stories of Jesus that the world may be awakened to God's love. And in the power of that love, the Holy Spirit will heal our brokenness. And our generation will hear the story of Jesus and the good news of the gospel of Christ that repairs our brokenness. John Wesley said, God knows nothing of solitary religion. No person ever went to heaven alone. No church will be perfect, not even ours. But the fellowship of the church is where we will find the love of God and then feel and know the urge to share that love. You see, St Paul and the Beatles were right. All you need is love. May each of us and all of us be rooted and grounded in love. God's love. And then let's share the love wherever God in Christ gives us opportunity. Amen. Yeah.
let us pray. And that is the response when I say loving and caring God. Please join with me saying hear our prayer. Loving and caring God. Hear our prayer. Loving and generous God. In this Easter season, we give thanks that our community and your whole church is rooted in love. Help us this day and every day to sense your presence in our hearts and minds. Help us to see your presence in our communities and the wider world. May we rejoice when we see love in action, hope maintained, help offered and care exercised. May we practice those gifts of love in our daily lives, within our families, communities, places of work and our churches. May we not be afraid to share the good news of faith with our communities. Grant us the imagination and the words at appropriate times to speak of our faith and the strength to live out what we speak in actions and love. Loving and caring God, hear our prayer. We pray for each other asking that you deepen the bonds of love and fellowship between us. May we truly be your family upholding one another, but always open to welcoming new people to our fellowship. Bless the work of our churches. May we truly reflect your love and care for humanity. May our churches be beacons of hope within communities and a wider world of need. Loving and caring God, hear our prayer. We pray for a world in need. In a moment of silence, we recall events in the news where people and the planet suffer. Lord, in particular, we pray for our countries around the world where there is a famine, tragedies, tragedies, human made tragedies, war, Ukraine and Russia friction between uh, uh, China and America, other Middle East countries. Because of a lot of political problems, the innocent people suffer. We pray for our countries like in India, the political uprise. You bring peace. And stability. We hold before God any known to us in particular need. Loving and caring God, hear our prayer. As we rooted in love, we thank you that you uphold us enabling our lives and the life of our churches to flourish. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us say together the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray together and whatever the form and whatever the language that you are familiar with. Let us say together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is worked within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, for ever and ever. Amen.